Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Welcome to the Authors Forum at JVRD. It's my pleasure to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Colin McCannell, who is a professor of ophthalmology at the Stein Eye and Doheny Eye Institutes at the University of California. Today, we're going to be discussing his recent publication, Primary Autologous Stem Cell Transplantation for Unilateral Primary Central Nervous System Lymphoma, discussing the ophthalmic variant or primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. Welcome, Colin. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Tim. Uh, glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Well, I think this is our unique opportunity for our listeners to get a flavor of how we choose the manuscripts, how we direct the research that we do, and what really are the clinical pearls that we can apply in our practice. So can you tell me what first caught your attention about this manuscript? I've had an interest in vitreoretinal lymphoma since my days at the Mayo Clinic. I kept a database of the outcomes uh, of all the patients back from the 70s and noticed that most patients uh, eventually succumb to the vitreoretinal lymphoma, regardless of treatment type. And that was later on published in a, in a, in a study that Grimm and Polito, looking at uh, tr local treatment and, and whatever systemic treatment was done back then and seeing whether or not it prolonged survival. And it really didn't do much and the local treatment didn't didn't affect survival much. It affected vision, but not survival. So I thought it was um, a very frustrating condition. And over time, I got more and more interested and, and, and sort of developed my own thinking about it. And we used to call it, you know, reticulum cell sarcoma, then primary intraocular lymphoma, then vitreoretinal lymphoma. And I think now the best term that is being used is primary central nervous system lymphoma ocular, ocular variant. And the way I think about it is that the, you know, since since the retina, the optic nerve are derived embryologically from the same tissue as the brain, namely the neural tube. It really is central nervous system lymphoma when it's in the eye. Uh, the vitreous is, is mesenchymal, so that's maybe a little bit in the gray area. However, if you look at the statistical distribution of how many cases of central nervous system lymphoma that show up in the brain every year, about 1,500, versus those that show up in the eye, um, which is a, a small fraction of that, it's about the distribution ratio of the weight of the eye versus the weight of the brain, which the eye, eye is about um, 12 grams, the, the two eyes together, six gram each eye, and the brain is about 12 to 1500 grams. And so it's about a one, to you know, one in a hundred uh, a ratio. And that's, a, I think, about what we see, although the epidemiologic studies are not terribly great and, and precise. So I'm just thinking it's just a random distribution where it shows up first when it's central nervous system lymphoma, so Colin, I'm interested, you know, it seems to me that, the, the, you know, this is such a unique masquerade that, that it's really been important for us to kind of understand how do we make this diagnosis? And I think we've become better at that and you've written about that. And I also have the impression, at least in my own practice, that we're seeing more of these patients than we have in the past. So I don't know if we're diagnosing them better and earlier, but I'm seeing patients with primary CNS ophthalmic, you know, lymphoma at ages that I used to lecture with that weren't possible. So it, do you have some feeling that that's correct in your practice also? I am seeing younger patients. Um, the, 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 the range for CNS lymphoma in general has, has dipped down into the 30s uh, that, that I've seen patients. For, I also see a lot of CNS uh, patients that have secondary ocular involvement, and they're really all over the map. Um, so I think it is increasing the CNS lymphoma in general, and, and therefore also the ocular variant that we see in, in, as, as ocular oncology uh, specialists. And um, the diagnosis is getting better, although it is still challenging to convince the oncologists when we only have a few cells on the slide to, to give full, full court press chemotherapy. And that was uh, in this, in this uh, manuscript that we published um, that was a unique thing. We were able to do a coronal biopsy and prove to the oncologist 
and the and the pathologist definitively that it was CNS large or that it was diffuse large blood cell lymphoma. Um, the, the, the vitreous specimen had had two or three abnormal B, B lymphocytes on it. And they're like, well, we can't give aggressive chemotherapy with this little evidence because patients can die. And then when we did the cori retina biopsy, we could prove it definitively. And I was able to convince the oncologist to go ahead and, and treat it as if you would, as if you would with the most aggressive uh, uh, therapy used for primary central nervous system lymphoma of the brain. And so that's why we ended up with autologous stem cell transplantation. And those two patients have done wonderfully, as one would predict, because over the years, we've gotten more aggressive with the therapy. And in the, in the, in the, in the early part of this, you know, in the tens of this, uh, this uh, century, um, methyl high dose methotrexate therapy became more and more common, survival prolonged. Um, then in CNS lymphoma, uh, you know, when it's in the brain, uh, stem cell, autologous stem cell transplantation became more and more commonly used with increased survival. And I think that's what we should be doing for the eyes as well. You alluded to something that I think is, is very important. In the past, I've had relationships with my oncologists that when I gave them the diagnosis of ocular lymphoma, they would proceed to treat the patient. But this newer generation of younger oncologists have been very focused on getting clear cut diagnostic biopsies that are often unobtainable. And I remember well, and I think you've seen this case also, a case that Tom Albini did, where we watched the lymphoma massively progress without his being able to encourage the oncologist to treat. So I do think you've you really nailed the the you know the the problem here, which is you can know that diagnosis, but your colleagues may not be comfortable with treating. I think that's a little sad for our patients, but that's the world we live in. And so I made the same comment that you made with Tom. I said, you know, you just have to get a diagnosis that they're comfortable with. And, and that's, that's difficult, but usually you, you can get that through primary vitrectomy or a chorioretinal biopsy. I usually will do vitreous first and then aspirate the, the pockets of lymphomatous cells before I go to a biopsy. Is that sort of how you approach that or do you go right to chorioretinal biopsy? When there's retinal involvement, I do like to do a chorioretinal biopsy because that gives us the most definitive, predictably best specimen. We, we do have trouble with the vitreous getting good, uh, good specimens for the, for the um, cytopathologists. So that's a problem. What I would like to see the field evolve to, and now with um, the increasing use of liquid biopsy and being able to diagnose um, MIDI88 and uh, the, the um, neuroglobulin gene uh, uh, rearrangements and IL-10 to IL-6 ratios, we have a lot of indirect tests. And when, when we look at those in, in, in concert, I think there's a constellation of those tests being abnormal that, that, is, that can only be B-cell lymphoma. And we have to convince our oncologists, just like we don't we don't look for um, spirochetes to diagnose syphilis uh, in modern medicine. Uh, we, we we look for markers that uh, antibodies that show us that the patient has syphilis, and then we treat it. Even if there's a little bit of syphilis there or a little bit of TB, we give full court press treatment. And I think that's what we need to be doing in, in ocular oncology with lymphoma. We need to establish the validity of indirect markers as diagnosing diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in the CNS, including the eye, number one. And number two, then say, even if it's just one eye, it's the same thing as if it's in the brain. And just like, that's like a little bit of TB. We're going to have to give the full course treatment from the get-go that, that we know works well for, for, for lesions in the brain. Because when they get recurrence and have brain lesions, their prognosis has changed. It's worse. So I totally think that is the single most important statement that, that really has come out of this. If you're pushing hard for an aggressive systemic therapy established in the diagnosis, regardless of unilateral or bilateral, and you're also suggesting that we should be able to move away from these invasive chorioretinal biopsies if possible to do something more in a, in a liquid biopsy, 100% agree. I don't think it's the ocular oncologist that's the problem here, right? Right, So yes, absolutely. And I've had many discussions with, our, with the head of our lymphoma unit, and he says, you know, Colin, I'm sorry, you know, we have a tumor board and it has to pass a tumor board uh, to, to, go the, to go to stem cell transplantation. And I'm sorry, two or three cells on the slide don't, don't make the cut. And it doesn't matter what else you have. And, and so now I, I'm initiating discussions 
you know, about these indirect tests, you know, mighty 80, especially if they're in concert, the IL 10 to IL six ratio in the aqueous is remarkably accurate. If you look at the literature, and then if you get a mighty 88 with that, with a liquid biopsy, then it can't really be anything else. And then if you also get gene rearrangement, uh, uh, genes that you can document, I mean, how much more evidence do you need? <laughs> Totally agree with you. So I think that what what you what you're doing is pushing our our oncology colleagues to understand where we are as ocular oncologists. And I think by your manuscript showing that these patients have the ability to do remarkably well, which which is which is unique. I mean, these patients traditionally have had very poor outcomes um, with progression to CNS involvement. And then, and then death. So I think that, that this is really why these reports are so critical. Right. And those two patients, um, now the manuscript was written uh, over a year ago now before it got published. So they're now nine years out, but each of them, and that's pretty good. Um, you know, 10 years ago, 30% of patients had uh, recurrence by, by, by five years. Uh, uh, yeah, more than 30% didn't have recurrence by five years. So, so incredibly high recurrence rate. And we, you know, two, two patients obviously doesn't make a definitive study, but, you know, they're doing remarkably well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, those two patients are so exceptional that even though it's only two patients, it has the capacity to shift our approach to therapy. So I think that I think that's one of the things that is most important with these unique kind of small case series is that they, they give us the, the proof, you know, of principle that yes, this can work and hopefully that can disseminate to our colleagues. So, so I, I think what, what you have done is remarkable. So you're moving toward a more aggressive liquid biopsy. You're moving toward a more aggressive systemic therapy. You're willing to do whatever it takes to establish the diagnosis, including chorioretinal biopsy, which I think is, is important. I think that you need to step your approach, but I think that the, the new liquid tests and the ability to do next generation sequencing on some of these eyes is, is incredible. So what's your, what, what do you think for our, our younger um, colleagues that will listen to this and read your paper? Um, where is this, where are we going in the future with, with vitreoretinal lymphoma? Well, I can say, I think um, we're, we are hopefully going to be able to establish in the next five years or so that this indirect testing is definitive, that it is not suggestive, just like a, a, a TPA test is definitive for, for syphilis, or, or, or now the uh, quantifier gold test is definitive for TB, and, we can go ahead and, and then we can go ahead and treat uh, aggressively. And I think the understanding in the field in general is evolving toward the concept that even if it's in one eye, it is central nervous system lymphoma. And I think more and more people are at least talking about treating more aggressively, but I think we're still held back. There was a paper published um, um, in 2011, the primary vitreoretinal lymphoma report from an international primary central nervous system lymphoma collaborative group symposium. And basically they suggested um, that if there's no CNS lymphoma uh, in, uh, present at the time of diagnosis, it should only be local therapy. And I think, that paper really sort of took hold and 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 laid a, laid a roadmap that has not been um, adequately flexible and hasn't evolved enough yet. But I think we're we're going to see some changes in the next five years because there's been so many, so many changes in molecular diagnostics and also understanding of these diseases. And I also think that we take care of these patients better from a systemic oncology perspective. So you know they're they're looking at risk and benefit, and I think you and I would would say that. The, the benefit far outweighs the risk, clearly, when we do this. And then, and then just one last comment before, before I let you go. Um, this really is one of the true masquerades. And I, and I reemphasize over and over again to our colleagues that keep that in the back of your mind when you are looking at this patient that's atypical, that maybe you're looking at lymphoma. So on that note, which has nothing directly to do with the publication, but taking a little bit of aqueous from the anterior chamber and sending it for IL-10 and IL-6 um, quantification and looking at that ratio is incredibly helpful 
and will almost always, in my opinion, that'll be one of our um, most robust tests from what I've seen and I've reviewed the literature. It's, it's really quite remarkable and it's such an easy test to do. And then the, the gene rearrangements in Mighty 88 and other uh, testing will be uh, um, confirmatory, but I think that that'll set you off in the right direction um, right from the get-go. Well, like everything else, if you don't look for it, you don't think about it, you'll never find it. So Dr. McConnell, thank you so much for joining us from the UCLA Stein and Doheny Eye Institute. And I look forward to our listeners reading your upcoming paper in JVRD. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.